Meg McWilliam comes to us from the Denver Office of Populous. She can run in circles around all of us as a triathlete. She's here now. Please welcome Meg McWilliam. It's all yours. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you again for the opportunity to be here today. It's not often that architects are invited to speak at sports business summits. Um, and so this is a really great opportunity to share a little bit about what we do and how we think about the sports market a little bit differently um, from a facility standpoint and how your facility can add value to your team and your programs. Um, how many people in the room have heard of Populous? How many people in the room have experienced one of our venues that you know of? Um, I, I'm willing to bet 95% of you have been in a facility that we have either designed or touched at some point in its life cycle. So I'll start out by um, giving you all a brief introduction to Populous, um, because we're not, we're not necessarily a, a name you hear on the business side of sports, but definitely on the facility design side. We're an international design practice. We are one of the top 10 most innovative architecture companies in the world, according to Fast Company. And we have offices across the globe. Um, we're concentrated in three primary regions, here in the United States, Europe and the Middle East, and then Asia Pacific. So that gives us the, the tools and the understanding of a broader sports market than perhaps just your local St. Louis market or Denver or wherever you happen to have a facility, which means we can draw from the things that are happening across the globe. Architects Journal, which is more of a, an architecture-specific publication, um, named us their International Practice of the Year in 2014. This was a huge honor for us, and a lot of it came from the innovation that we do in sporting facility design. Rolling Stone has also given us a nod. Um, four of the top 10 venues that rock are populous facilities. Um, designing and, and building a facility that's multi-use is really important to us. Whether your season is 16 games or closer to 100, we want to make sure that you're getting the best life cycle you can out of the facility that you have. To name some of our projects and, and some of the, um, the folks that we work with, Major League Baseball. We've designed 19 Major League ballparks. We've worked with more than 30 teams. MLS, we've designed five stadiums and worked with 22 teams on either their stadium modifications or practice facilities. 17 NBA and NHL arenas with 22 separate teams. 14 NFL stadiums with 30 teams. Um, so you, you see the, the breadth that we, um, we encapsulate here in the United States. We've also worked with more than 130 NCAA Division I schools. So we have this, this huge portfolio of understanding, um, but we're architects. We're not business people. Um, and last spring, as Patrick mentioned, we were fortunate to work with a group of students from here at Washington University on a project that we affectionately named Sports Plus, looking from a business side at what the future of elite training would look like and how it starts to integrate um, multidisciplinary approaches to athlete training. That's really important for us as architects to understand because those, those um, innovative approaches and cross-disciplinary approaches to training have space implications. And if we don't understand what's happening on the, on the business case, uh, we can't really design the spaces that support those, um, those new innovations and, and the cross-pollination of different disciplines. So we had a great team from both Populous and Washington University. We went on some awesome field trips. We had some great meetings. We had a lot of phone calls. Um, and, and ultimately, um, I'm, not, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the process that we went through with the Washington University team, um, but take it a step further because I, I'm, I'm not sure we've communicated with our team what we've done with the information they've provided us. So I'm gonna provide some insight into what we're doing and, and why this was such a valuable um, proposition for us as well. We started out the semester by asking the students we were working with a few key questions. What defines an innovative training facility? Which markets are leading the way in innovative sports training? And which current and future trends will define the direction of this emerging market? There were really three approaches that we took to answering these questions. 
Um, the first was facility research, looking at innovative training facilities. And a great place to start with that is looking at the leagues and conferences um, that are really leading the charge and recognizable to um, anyone off the street. So our team looked at more than 250 training facilities, not just here in the United States, but around the globe, um, to really understand what's happening in these facilities and what's innovative. They identified, with our assistance, a series of innovative features that takes into account um, current trends, future trends, things that we've seen in the industry for a while, and, and how they are mixed together to create these new hybrid facilities that enhance sports performance. Again, they looked everywhere, um, which was, was a great activity for us um, as a global practice so that we could understand not just what's happening in our own backyard, but across the world, and, and provided some insight into the way different places do the same thing in different ways. And they came up with a number of matrices that we could take a look at as architects. And while this may not seem to provide any insight from a business case, as an architect, I can look at the age of facilities, the size of facilities, and the cost of facilities that are innovative and say, you know what, client? You don't have to spend a lot of money. Your facility doesn't have to be brand new. It doesn't have to be huge to be a, a hotbed for innovation in training technology and sports performance. This is really helpful for us in, in communicating with clients um, so that they understand the, the capacity to be innovative isn't defined by your budget or your available square footage, which, which sometimes we automatically default to. We also opened our Rolodex, um, our, our phone contact list, and um, shared contacts that we have across the industry. Everyone from Alex Guerrero with TB12, who is Tom Brady's personal trainer, um, to facility managers and doctors and um, technology experts. We, look, we talk to medical professionals, trainers and coaches, and, and people who are developing new technology and products that are all about sports science and sports performance. And we're surveyed. Um, the, the team did an excellent job of reaching out to um, people across disciplines and surveying them about what do they think is innovative? What facilities do you think are top of the market based on your expertise? What elements and amenities make these facilities really special? Put them at the top of the game. And at the top of the list, you'll see multidisciplinary staff. This is um, something that we're increasingly seeing in the market, but it's still emerging. Um, there are a lot of challenges when you bring people with different backgrounds into the same space. Um, fortunately, in sports performance, we're always going for the same goal. Um, so you can share the vision and, and really encourage the cross-collaboration that way. Um, we also had a number of um, case studies that looked at high-performance facilities in the United States and across the globe to understand what facilities um, are doing that's innovative and different. We looked at the Devon Boathouse um, that attracts athletes from all across the country as the rowing hub of the United States Olympic community. The Australian Institute of Sport in Canberra, which is um, a working laboratory for athletes and participants. UPMC Lemieux Campus in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, which is a, an outpatient treatment facility that is also the training complex for the Pittsburgh Penguins. And last but not least, um, and, and I think our team would say this is the gold standard globally of facilities that are currently doing this, the Etihad Campus in Manchester. Um, it consolidates existing facilities and has really formed a community that is grounded and based in sports science and sports performance. So with all of this information that Washington University provided, um, we as populists took a, a number of steps from a business standpoint and from a design standpoint 
um, to, to move forward uh, based on the research that was provided. The first question we can ask is, where do we stand in the market? Uh, the, the wealth of research that our friends from Washington University provided us with gave us an understanding of where we are in training facility development, where our facilities stand in comparison to global leaders, how we're doing against our competition. At the end of the day, while we're still designing, while we're designing sports facilities, we're still competing. We're still a business. And we have to understand what everyone else is doing so that we can continue to elevate our own game. Um, we've looked at our list of facilities that we have um, completed in the last 15 years and took a look at which do we think are meeting the mark. What's hitting the mark in terms of the, um, the definitions that the Washington University team developed as innovative? We've taken a look at current and future trends and how they define the direction of this emerging market. The Washington University team gave us four insights into trends that are developing across the market and things that our experts uh, are saying are going to explode um, that have space implications as we're thinking about the next generation of training facility. The first being individualized care. Um, thinking about athletes as individuals beyond sports-specific training and really using our full toolkit to make sure that I as an individual am the best athlete I can be and you as an individual are the best athlete you can be and she as an individual is the best athlete she can be. There's a lot of science and, and medicine that goes into this. So we start to see the cross-disciplinary collaboration as an important part of this. But beyond that, we can start understanding the need for space. If we're doing 3D gate analysis, um, that's a significant chunk of space and it costs money to do that. Is that a high priority item for the client? Is it a low priority item for the client? Um, 3D motion tracking, not everyone is running in their sport. There are different movement patterns and we need to be able to understand how bodies move in space. Um, we start to get into ideas about genetics, about what's already inside of us and how that impacts our performance. Um, this ties definitely into the individualized training programs um, and looking at genetic markers. So if we're, if we're moving in this direction, if we're starting to do genetic testing in training facilities, what do we need to include? Well, we probably need some phlebotomy. We probably need a wet lab so that we can test, or we have to make the decision operationally that we're going to do this testing off-site. So there are, there are space decisions that, again, happen with um, using genetics to determine markers, to determine performance ability, um, and, and really making the most of what we have inside of us as individual athletes. Nutrition, um, increasingly, we know nutrition is important, um, but as we start to understand our gut microbiome, as we start to see the impacts that the things that we eat have on our ability to perform at a high level, and not just to perform, but also recover after a hard effort, whether that's a game or practice, um, is really important. Um, we heard earlier with the Gatorade um, development league for the NBA, that it's, it's becoming the testing ground for nutrition uh, for basketball players. And it's really interesting to hear that crossover um, because as an architect, I think about, well, your sweat testing. Cool. How are you monitoring that? Are you using a wireless patch? Do I need to provide you infrastructure to be able to handle that load? What are you doing with data privacy? Do you have to be HIPAA compliant? Because that all impacts what we have to do on all of the things that you don't see inside of a building. So seeing nutrition um, as an emerging trend and starting to understand where nutrition is going beyond the Gatorade cooler, where you come in after practice and you grab your Gatorade and you go, um, is, is crucial to the, the next iteration of high-performance training facilities. And last but certainly not least, sleep and recovery. How many of you uh, feel a little bit foggy if you don't get enough sleep. 
How many of you, um, if you don't get enough downtime, not necessarily sleep, just downtime, get a little bit uh, crabby? So in your own lives, you can see the importance of sleep and recovery in your day-to-day activities. Now imagine uh, four-hour blocks of training twice a day, intense training, and then strength sessions and media appearances. It can wear you down really fast. And so sleep and performance, sleep and recovery, are um, increasingly important in our understanding of athlete performance. It's not just what you're doing on the field for practice. It's not just what you're eating in that hour window after you step off the field. It's all of the things you're doing in your off time and understanding how they play into performance. So we're starting to see sleep and recovery have a home in these facilities, whether it's with nap pods. Um, The Australian national rugby team actually has barracks, essentially, um, in their new training facility where athletes are encouraged to go and sleep for a minimum of two hours between two-a-day practices because the Australian Institute of Sports has found a definitive link between sleep and performance, and, and they've, they've narrowed that window into um, immediately after sports training. Again, it takes space. It takes thinking about acoustics. We can't really have um, nap pods next to the weight room because you're going to have some issues with sound transfer and, and things like that. Um, and, and so being mindful of these trends definitely has a huge impact um, on our facility, our ability to design the next iteration of sports performance facility. So our, our last question, what defines an innovative sports training facility? From our perspective, one of the most powerful outcomes of our collaboration with Washington University is defining the language of sports facilities. How many of you um, think sports performance and sports science and and sports medicine can be used interchangeably? Don't be shy. Um, In our office, we've used all three of these interchangeably until very recently. You see, in in the facility training market, um, there hasn't been clear definition on the language of what you specifically mean when you are talking about a sports performance facility or a sports science facility or a sports medicine facility. Uh, Washington University has given us the tools to define this language in a way that's meaningful not only to us as architects, understanding what we need to put in a facility, but to owners, to users, to the people that are, are in this building day in and day out after we turn it over. So I'd like to share those definitions, um, courtesy of our, our Washington University team. Um, We settled on on sports performance being facilities that excel in sports performance, um, focus on individual athlete capabilities in their sport. This is a very athlete-centric approach. The focus is on me as an individual and what has to be done to make me top of my game. Sports science is... um, conducting applied research in human physiology in order to understand improved performance in athletes. So taking a really measured, logical approach to understanding how our bodies work and how we can best apply what we know about human kinetics to individual um, or, or groups of athletes. Basketball players move differently than hockey players move differently than swimmers move differently than golfers. So we can study groups of individuals using sports science and get some general rules. Um, this is a, a very measured and academic approach to improving our ability to train athletes. And last but certainly not least, sports medicine And facilities that excel in sports medicine optimize the treatment and the prevention of sports-related injuries and disease. So this is where we start to see medical testing, genetic testing, um, come under the the umbrella of sports training facilities in a new and, and different way, bringing in professionals who maybe wouldn't have five years ago stepped inside a a training facility except to assess an active injury. 
um, our understanding of prehabilitation, the things that we can do with the way that our bodies work to prevent injury in the first place is much greater now um, than it was even a decade ago. And so sports medicine increasingly has a home um, in sports facilities. So we have all of this great, organ or great information from um, our Washington University team and, and the insights that they provided. So where do we go from here? Um, I don't have a lot of slides on these because I'm going to share a little bit about our business and, and our strategy. Um, the outcomes that we got from the students here at Washington University have been really crucial in taking a hard look at our business plan and our strategic approach to the market of sports facilities. It's caused us to take a look at the competitive landscape and understand what additional expertise do we need to bring in-house. We're architects. We specialize in stadiums, arenas, and, and sports facilities. We're not medical architects. We don't deal with 3K Tesla machines. We have never designed phlebotomy labs. So what do we need to do to keep ourselves competitive in this market as we start to see the interdisciplinary approach to training take off? Um, it's, it's encouraged us to own the language of these types of facilities, where, as before, you know, we, we use sports science, sports medicine interchangeably. Well, now we know better. And we can own that language as we talk to clients, as we engage in new facilities, um, and as we really advance the ball on the next iteration of training facility design. And last but not least, um, we, we're taking a look at our own innovation, how we think about projects. Um, we're used to working with teams and owners. And, and an important part of what we learned from the Washington University research is that partnerships are crucial to these cross-disciplinary functions, um, facilities, whether that's with a healthcare provider, with a medical school, or with another third-party organization. We have to understand that there are more players in the game now and, and really work on our ability to hear beyond our traditional clients to understand where other entities and other individuals may be coming from. Um, and that's really giving us a, a leg up on, we, on going after um, the, the next series of sports training facilities and understanding um, what comes next. Over our 34-year history, uh, we've prided ourselves on being innovators. Um, in 1986, we opened the first um, stadium with club level as the result of, of collaboration with ownership groups and understanding uh, the need for a new ticketing model. We push ourselves as an organization to drive innovation every day. We like to think that we're not just architects, we're entrepreneurs. Um, and so we're always looking out for what the next great innovation is. Uh, Washington University has been a really great partner in helping us do just that. And we're hopeful we get to continue the relationship moving forward. Any questions for Meg? Questions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you feel that as a role, um, as you talk to clients, you've shown them that these should be priorities um, as they're trying to uh, assuage the general public fears related to sports injuries? And yeah, we've seen a shift specifically um, with the NFL, but also at the Division One level with the NCAA in the focus on head injury um, and understanding how we treat it immediately and what facilities are needed for that. Um, and modifying existing facilities to have a concussion testing room and, and have some of the equipment on site so that you can do an assessment and so that you can meet the requirements of different organizations, whether that's a, a coach or a team medical practitioner doing the testing or whether it has to be a third-party individual. Um, you know, we, we feel very strongly as an organization about um, athlete health and wellness, and so a lot of times our clients come to us with ideas, and, and part of our job as architects and facility designers is to advocate for industry best practices, even if they aren't currently widely adopted. And so we're in a unique position to ask questions, ask hard questions. Have you thought about 
having an MRI on site so that you can do rapid scanning? Have you thought about um, ensuring that there's a quiet space for concussion testing? Have you thought about this requirement that's not mandated yet but will likely be in three to five years? And so we try to take an active role in encouraging our clients to do the right thing, but ultimately um, it's, it's on their shoulders to make the ultimate decision. Yeah? Uh, I know in the, the gaming space, they replicate a lot of the stadiums. Uh, do your architects get involved with that, or is it more just you know, selling rights to, for gaming companies like FIFA? Right. And, and That's an interesting yeah. question. I don't know that we have ever been approached. Um, it, it has to do with the gaming space and the replication of physical uh, facilities in games. Uh, I don't know that we've ever been approached by a game development company to provide our drawings or renderings or, or anything like that of the facility. Um, I think they can get a lot of the information they need just from publicly available photographs. Um, but it, we're definitely interested in the esports space and, and the, um, the space requirements of, of some of the games and the competitions and, and understanding lessons from the virtual world that we can apply in the physical space. One more question for Meg. Yeah. Sure. Vestibular rehabilitation is a very specialized kind of physical therapy that is focused on balance and coordination issues that come after um, brain injury like concussion. And so um, vestibular therapists are specialized in being able to test for and treat the um, hard-to-track symptoms of um, concussion. We've had a couple of Sports Business Journal 40 Under 40 winners here today, and I'm predicting that sometime in the next few years, Meg McWilliam will join that group of people. So let's hear it for Meg. (laughs) You flatter me. (laughs) 